everybody and welcome back to Finding Fashion. Today I'm so happy to be joined by Maria Kovax, who is creative director and co-founder of Ready to Wear Hairdressing, as well as being a freelance session stylist. Thanks so much for joining me, Maria. It's lovely to see you. You too, Hannah. It's, it's really cool to be here. So let's, let's get chatting. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to hear all about your amazing career. So can you tell me a little bit more about like how you got into hairdressing? Yes, yeah, so hairdressing to me came a little bit later in life. I um I started hairdressing actually at 19, which traditionally is a little bit late for hairdressers in Australia. And it all started because my friends were all hairdressers. I'm, I'm not sure why, it just happened that way. And I used to model for them in their hairdressing competitions. At the time, their boss was the winner of the international styling award which at this is going on over 25 years ago very long time ago it was a very prestigious event and I was the hair model for this styling awards and I just when I was there with that with what was going on with what they were doing in the competitions I entered this world that was surreal it was magic it I mean it I didn't I wouldn't consider it work I thought it was really beautiful there were all these beautiful people everywhere um being creative there was music playing and I just thought it was magic and actually I was bitten by the bug so from that I actually bet them what do you think if I could become a hairdresser and they said you wouldn't last five minutes Maria. let's bet you fifty dollars <laughs> so I then went forth being my stubborn self went into my local hairdresser where I was where I was living in the suburbs in western Sydney and I offered myself to this salon and said, look, I really love to work here. What have you got? And there were a brother and sister in the salon and they gave me a job. Now that was okay. I kind of learned how to shampoo and you know, just the general setup of a salon because it was completely alien to me that at that stage. And then when I did have a day off, I used to go shopping in the city in Pitt Street, which is a very it's kind of like our Oxford Street at the time. So it's got, you know, all the lovely fashion stores. And I used to go into this arcade where there was this amazing looking salon. And I'd always walk past a marvel. They had um, a mosaic Versace tiles on the floor and it was very ornate. And I, I said to the receptionist one day, I was shopping, I said, do you mind if I um, actually shampoo for you for free today? I would really love to just see how your salon works. I think it's beautiful. I was in love with the place. And they actually gave me a job that day. They'd never met anyone that offered to work for free. They thought I was a freak of nature. <laughs> and that was probably 26, 27 years ago. And the rest is history. Wow. Well, <laughs> you've got a good- I won the bet. Yeah, you won it. You've got an amazing return on that bet. They, so. they still owe me that 50 bucks, though. Right. They haven't paid up on that big time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So throughout your career, you've gone on to work with some like incredible clients. And I've got to kind of ask you about kind of the Cara de Levines and, and the Pamela Andersons who you've worked with, like such icons. For people like that who have got kind of like, quite distinctive styles of their own. Like, how do you go about like creating hair looks which are kind of push the boundary bit a bit, a bit, but also stay true to their own style? Well, I think when you're working with people like that, it's all about listening. Mm -hmm. And no matter how famous they are or what their platform is, um, your hair is very personal. So if I ever show up to a job like that, it's it's a little bit overwhelming sometimes because quite often the person that you're working on isn't the issue, it's the people around them. Mm -hmm. And when you actually speak to the person that you're working on this icon, they're usually just a fragile person, normal with all the same feelings that we have. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think the most important thing is to listen and just make sure that they're happy. And I think that's what's worked for me. So, you know, and especially when you think of someone like Pamela Anderson, someone was asking me the other day, because I don't really talk about these things. It's just things I, you know, accidentally get a job somehow and, it, and it's doing her hair. And she was the loveliest lady, very quietly spoken. And she just wanted her hair done and be happy and feel good about herself. So, 
you know that for me it's all about listening I think it's a super important thing and be humble Mm -hmm. and don't try and show every skill that you have in the world to that person just listen to what they want get it done and get out of there (laughs) don't faff around that's such (laughs) good advice for whatever area of the industry that you go in it is all about listening isn't it like if you yeah. go in as a freelance stylist, if you go as a freelance like hairstylist, like makeup artist, photographer, you've got to listen to your client, haven't you? And listen to your team. It's so important. It's the most important thing because at the end of the day, you're supplying a service. It's not about you. It's not about your ego. It's about that person making them happy. And that's the most important thing mm-hmm. to me. Completely anyway. agree. So another arm of your industry that you went into, um, which also must have won you some more some interest on that bet, was going to be creative director of Tony and Guy Australia, which is was just incredible part of your career. How did you kind of work with the global teams there to kind of develop looks for campaigns which really represented the brand? Oh uh, yeah, I mean for me that feels like a lifetime ago, and that's when you realise that. You, you that's you're getting old <laughs> so um that for me is a really important journey because I started when I started at Tony and Guy I was the very first assistant they ever hired in Australia it was when the first franchise was opening so in those days that was a really big thing because it was the first global company that was coming to Australia as a hairdressing brand and it created a lot of noise in those days Um, And if you're familiar with the system of Tony and Guy, you have to go through a training system um, and you have to pass everything. And then you have to go through a vardering system, which is our training system to become qualified. And then once you sit your test, if you become qualified, then you can be on the floor. And as you move up through the system, Uh, there's a stylist top stylist star director and art director that is of your salon so in those days that we my boss at the time was very much a company person so we he strictly followed the way everything was happening in London Mm -hmm. and it wasn't diluted because there weren't as many franchises in those days and so it was a really great um, breeding ground for hairdressers and great training for me And because the world wasn't as big yet, when the big hairdressers like Anthony at the time, a scholar and his wife Pat were coming to Australia, I met them and I could work with them. Mm. So I worked my way through the system and then became creative director of the salon, then art creative director of my region. And then you start training assistants, first of all, and we had to go to art team training every week. So it took many years to get to that point. So by the time I got to creative director of Australia, you know, you go through working in the salon. I think it's every segment of what you do to get to that point is really important. Not just the the things that they make you go through, but doing clients, working in the school, teaching assistants and, and understanding that you're learning skills every day. So once I got to that point, then I started to travel to London. And every year at Salon International, we would have a conference here in London with Tony and Guy and all the art directors from around the world showed up. And then we worked on the new collection that was shared with us. And then we did the show at Salon. So all the art directors from the world, not all, but most of the ones that could come, did the show at Salon International and then with the main team. And then we took that back to our countries. And then we followed through and taught that for the rest of the year. And then I was lucky enough a few times to come over and shoot the classics. So the training system that we have, the Vardering system, um, is based on the classic collection globally. Mm -hmm. So to be able to do one of the cuts from that was a really special thing for me in my career. So I did the Tony and Guy classics. Um, Mine was the round layer, which the irony of that haircut was that was my Achilles heel. (laughs) So it's quite funny when... (laughs) Sometimes I think God or the universe has a sense of humour because <laughs> when I got the phone call, oh, Maria, we've, we would like you to come to London and, and shoot the collection and be in the classics. That's a massive thing we would all dream about. And then I said, that's fantastic. What haircut am I doing? Oh, you're doing the round layer. And I thought, oh, God, it's like a double-edged sword. How am I going to do that? Anyway, 
I managed somehow. <laughs> and, you know, that's one of those things that you, it's another challenge that life brings. So, you know, we had a fantastic time. We used to come to London, I did the collections, and then I looked after the Asia part of education for Tony and Guy. So and myself and the um, technical director at the time, we went to Korea, Taiwan, um, Singapore, and Thailand, and we did all the education in that region, which was really, really great. So that was a really special time in my career. I really enjoyed it. And it makes you who you are, doesn't it, yeah. really? Yeah. How do you kind of like keep up with hairdressing trends and looks that are across all of those different regions? Did you find that different clients and different companies like in, in those different regions want different things? They do because every country has its own flavor. And I think that's something that I really learned to respect because as I used to come over to Europe all the time, we always put London uh, on a pedestal as far as hairdressing because it, it was the pinnacle of hairdressing. It had, I think because a lot of things were invented here and you know, Vidal Sassoon and the Tony and Guy era and the whole world used to come to Salon International. We worshiped everything that came out of Europe. But then as you start to travel in the other regions, they're all hungry for your information, but then the way they recreate it has its own flavor. And I think that was really important to respect um, because the clients receive it in a different way. So I think what we used to do was share the bones of it and the feeling of things. And then you'd, you'd realize, especially in Asia, kids are really cool. They, their, their fashion sense is amazing. Yeah. I mean, we could not wait to go shopping in Taiwan in the night markets or, I mean, those kids had the coolest clothes on and the way they put stuff together. And, you know, they're really into haircuts and color and um, more so than Australia, depending on the seasons as well. So, you know, in Sydney was a, quite a strong vibe for haircutting in the 90s, especially. Mm -hmm. um, but because of the sunshine and the lifestyle, a lot of people have long hair. Um, beachy type of textures it's only in different little regions like in Melbourne they're probably a bit more fashion conscious in a way they'd be a bit more edgy or so it, you really had to every region that we went to we shared everything because that's what they were excited about but then we tried to translate it into their region mm -hmm. the cool thing is though when you go to Taiwan to do education you work on Taiwanese models mm -hmm. so that instantly makes you translate whatever you're doing into what they're into does that kind of make sense so Definitely. um it's an organic thing you can't it, it's not something that's contrived you go with your books and what you whatever you're doing and your techniques and as soon as you get off the plane you're influenced by everything that's around you and and the people and and what they're wearing and where they're going out and and how they you know react interact socially so um, it's always an organic thing, and I found that really exciting. We loved it. It was an amazing time. I mean, I really feel, I hope we get that back for young people now, because to be able to travel like that and see people living in their countries, and, you know, that's the best way to learn about life, I think. It's like the university of life, travelling. Definitely. So it was amazing, yeah. And in terms of trends as well, so you go into so many different countries, you see different trends emerging in so many different regions. And like you say, they've all got their own flavor and they're all their own take on different trends. Yeah. When you go back to the salon and, you know, customers are wanting that like take on trends, how do you differentiate a trend that's gonna work editorially or one that's gonna work uh, in your salon? Um, I think that's a really individual thing and getting to know your clients because I think trends don't have to be really literal. It's a feeling. So if I, you know, clients never come in and say to you, can I have an unfashionable haircut, please? <laughs> I've never heard anyone say that. So, you know, sometimes hairdressers say, oh, trends aren't really relevant. Clients only want to trim. They want to know that you know what's going on. That's what they're paying for. So even if they just have a millimeter off the bottom, it's all about, oh, okay, so what's happening? Well, this season it's 
sea salt and texture. So let's dry your hair in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I could never do that at home. Well, let's do it here. So what I used to do, sometimes if they didn't have the latest fringe or the short layers or whatever was happening, I would dry their hair in a slightly different way or use a different product. Or if I did offer them a slightly different shape and they were, they were worried about maintaining it, I would offer them a free blow dry appointment on at another time during the week to have a practice with them that's so good yeah so that just gave them that little bit of security mm -hmm. and I think if you're working with a boss that trusts you in that way it's not that I was giving all my appointments away for free <laughs> but I did have a lot of clients coming in saying oh Maria can we just have that little practice blow dry that you were going to show me and they're yours forever mm -hmm. I think if you just give them that little bit of extra effort and talk to them about what you think is happening, even if they have a centimeter off every six weeks and they have the same highlights, they will trust you and they're yours forever. And that's a really important thing rather than just, you know, we used to bang into the assistant's heads. Don't just talk about where you're going on the weekend or that you've got sore feet. <laughs> <laughs> they can get that at home for free <laughs> it's about exciting them because that little hour that they give you is their time to you know feel great get excited or relax or talk about something other than their own problems or your problems it's about you know the whole experience and we used to think that was really important and I and I think that's still relevant now definitely yeah. 100%. Yeah. When I go to the hairdressers, like, all I want to do is just like, chill out. And I don't want to be up, well, especially at the moment, I don't want to be asked what's going, where am I going on holiday? Because I'm not going anywhere. But no, yeah, exactly, you, know, you really do want to work with a stylist who is really passionate about what they do. And you know, your stylist has got so much, such a breadth of information, exciting information that you know, I wouldn't know from, you know, not working in that industry. So to it make it just makes you want to go back doesn't it time after time yeah even if it's changing a parting or or I don't know I mean there's little things that especially if we say for instance we would be booked to do a show and the designer wants you to do a blow dry on 15 models but that blow dry is really specific it could have a 60s parting and a 70s texture and a I don't know, 50s volume and all of these little buzzwords create this blow dry that was one minute was just a really boring blow dry into something really special. Mm -hmm. And once you talk to clients with those emotive words, they get really excited by it as well. Then it's not just the blow dry anymore. I think if you really believe it yourself, then you're not lying. You're telling the truth. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So you know, the best salesperson in the world to me is someone that really believes in what they're selling you. Then they're not even selling it. They're just sharing something. Very they will make, they could sell a comb to a bald man. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all these old fashioned phrases as well. <laughs> Bring them on. Yeah. Yeah. So about the shows, like, cause you've, you know, worked all over the world. It's like New York, London, Milan, Paris, like all, all the fashion weeks when you are working with des those designers and they're talking to you about kind of their collection and what kind of looks that they want to create, how do you kind of have that flex and work with designers to create looks that complement the collection? Well, I think for me, again, it's about listening. So when I go into those situations where, you know, we always go for a hair test with any designer. So um, with some people you're really lucky, I really love to build relationships because I think if you're working on someone's collection, they've worked on that for six months, that's their baby. So it's been something that they've been growing in their heart, in their brain, in their belly, and that's representing them in their life. So it's really important. And I think the best way to create something that can deliver what that designer wants is by listening and uh, you know sometimes it's difficult because so everyone communicates in a different way so with you know you might turn up to a designer and they're great they have mood boards and they have they're very specific I want 
you know, this is my mood board, I want volume, I want a ponytail with my parting here and I want height there and I want straight ends and you're like, great. That's like black and white, it is what it is. And then you'll go to someone and then they'll be like, I want it big, I want it small, I want it soft, I want it hard, I want it textured, I want it smooth. <laughs> We've all where every, yeah, where every word they say contradicts itself. <laughs> and you look at them and you think, oh my God, I hope I don't look confused because I'm really confused. God help me, please. Right? So, and then there's other ones that will start Zooming you two months before it, sending you things ideas and really involve you some want to know what you think some don't want to know what you think so every single person you work with is different now i am um, i prefer someone that tells you what they want and i love images I, but you know what i'm at the stage in my life now that i'm not afraid to ask questions so i'm that annoying kid that will keep asking questions until i understand what they're talking about I'm the same because exactly. there's no shame in my game with that stuff because if I don't understand what they want I'm not going to be able to do it and we're all in trouble mm -hmm. and and then there's no point in the whole thing it's silly so there's no point being all cool and like oh yeah I get what you're saying and then go oh my god what am I going to do and you're talking to your team there and you're all like should we just leave and go to lunch let's not do hairdressing anymore why are we here you know you start questioning oh my god what are we gonna do should we just i don't know go and work at tesco and, and be a <laughs> checkout chick you know you start thinking you question yourself so i keep asking questions until i know what they will understand what they want some hair tests can go for two days mm -hmm. i've been in paris before doing a hair test with a designer that i knew i'd worked with them five seasons already and we worked seven hours and then it was 12 hours and then we thought oh my god we missed our Eurostar <laughs> and then we had nowhere to stay in Paris so we're walking around Paris with a suitcase um, trying to find a room <laughs> finding one and sleeping on the floor because there wasn't there wasn't enough bed for all of us um, and then I had to come back the next day and start again until I got understood what they wanted Mm -hmm. and that's what it is it's not always glamorous um sometimes I remember because you know it's logistics of of um hair test as well because sometimes the hair test is say for instance you're doing Paris fashion week sometimes the hair test is two days before the show sometimes it's a day before the show so you have to take a bag of hair with you that you know, a lot of really big shows might want extensions. So I used to have about five grand's worth of hair in my case, from Swedish blonde to jet black hair, real human hair. I used to order this hair from a hair company and say, look, I can't buy it all because I can't afford it. I will pay you what I use. So I'd carry this case of hair around with me <laughs> around Paris just in case someone needs hair in their show. Because if you're there and you can't get, give them what they want, you all of a sudden aren't at that standard anymore. Mm -hmm. I remember we were dyeing hair pieces until two in the morning the night before a show and running around Paris looking for colored hairspray for the next day. I mean, and then that hotel room looked like a clown had a party in it. <laughs> I mean, we ruined the we ruined the hotel room. I mean, it's endless. The, the amount of times that we've done really weird things to get so when we show up on the day, we look like we're all ready and we're ready to go and we're all perfect. In 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 essence, we haven't slept. We're all covered in pink coloured spray. Um, we've we've got you know we have to pay two hundred you know euros because we've ruined the room that we were in because it's covered in colour. You know, it's never ending. So um it's the logistics of it that's quite difficult for me that so you know be prepared for everything and even now uh, if I go and do some if I go and do a test now I have to take four cases I will take my hair equipment then I will take glue then I will take some hair I don't take every color in the world but I will if I know what color the model's hair is I will take hair their color mm -hmm. um just 
everything I can think of because bet your luck they will ask you for something that you don't have mm -hmm. so that's law. just that's sod's law so mm -hmm. it's the kitchen sink in my case you know when the uber shows up and they look at you and like are you traveling where are you going no I'm just going to work <laughs> well what are you doing just mind your business and help me get in the car <laughs> and that is not glamorous but yeah. best thing have a great like have someone with you that you really trust mm. I remember going to Paris as well on the Eurostar trying to carry all those cases on my own crying because I couldn't lift it all um I've had moments in my life like that as well and then you realize you can't do it on your own so you know team is really important people that you like working with that really support you and be prepared kitchen stink <laughs> <laughs> how do you pick yeah. distance how sorry do you, how do you pick good assistance like how do you know that somebody's going to be trustworthy and know that they're going to be able to support you in the way that you need like whether you're working on a shoot or if you're like behind the scenes like at the shows yeah I think that takes time for me it's not when I work with someone I would say they're my assistant they're just my I just call them my other brain my second brain <laughs> so um in case mine shuts down at any point I always I I mean I like to work with people that I trust and I'm quite a calm person in general but I know that I want someone that I can take anywhere and knows how to carry themselves not just work-wise but is kind to people and because they're a reflection on you so I would always want to be with someone that is nice to people how I'm nice to people and is respectful and just shows up and when they're there they want to be there and they put their heart into it and that for me is good and then the rest comes you know it's training and it's mm -hmm. getting to know each other and you know being for me being someone a, a great assistant because I was I'm always I'm still assisting other people mm -hmm. and I'm 48 and I loved being an assistant when I was because you, you want to be the eyes and the ears for that person and make that person look like a superhero, mm -hmm. that they don't have, they can do anything. And that for me is, you know, the person I'm working with at the moment who I've worked with for the past 10 years knows what I need. And I can just look at him and give him a wink and he'll pass me a comb or, <laughs> you know, it, and people look at us like, does she always just whistle at you or wink at you? Or I go, you know, like, <laughs> or, you know, do a wink or something. And he knows what I need. And that, that for me is, is great. And I can take him anywhere. And I know if something happened to me, he could show up instead of me and probably do just as good a job. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so if you want someone that's into it and wants to show up and is happy to be there, you don't want to drag someone around that doesn't really want to do it because this, it's draining. It's really draining. Yeah, that's really good advice there, because for so many students who are kind of looking to get work experience and internships and some of my students who, you know, they've just completed their like all their final major projects. They're now going into industry and applying for jobs and they think that they have to know everything straight away, whereas that's no. not the case at all. Like you say, like it comes with training. Ultimately, like your key skills, as it were, that you really want them to have are that they're trustworthy they want to be there you know they're gonna show up like they're you know they are willing to help you so it's quite comforting in a way to a lot of people who think that actually maybe they don't have all the experience in the entire world that actually like it that it comes with teaching it comes with teaching and experience and no one can give you that in a minute Mm -hmm. It's about, it's not like those sci-fi movies where people put a chip in their brain and all of a sudden they speak a language. Like hairdressing is not like that. Although I wish I had that and I would put every, you know, I'd just buy the chip, put it in my brain and then I instantly know it. It's not like that. It's hairdressing is being there and experience and you can't get that without doing it and trying. And my best advice is, you know, be the first one there never say no and wear comfortable shoes and I've been saying that for years <laughs> you know like just want to be there and people will want you around don't try and be a hero don't try and take over 
know how to gauge a room. And I was talking about this yesterday. I was on a job and the makeup artists were, you know, we all have downtime to chat with everyone. And we were talking about, well, what's a session person or a makeup artist? Or our job is quite tiring sometimes because we're working with new people in a new setting. And it's really important to gauge a room. So don't come in all guns blazing like John Wayne, like, oh, look at me. You know, if you walk into a room and it's really quiet, then realize it's going to be one of those days where you can be yourself, but you have to do your work and maybe not talk so much. <laughs> and then there's other places where the music's blaring and, you know, you can, you, it's really important to gauge every single situation you're in mm -hmm. and try and mold into that. Mm -hmm. and make that client happy and that's a big skill as well mm -hmm. I think it's super important because the quicker you get accustomed to your environment and you know you can understand the people that you're with the more inclined you are to do the best job you can that day it's like being the first the, the new kid at school every day yeah if that makes sense Definitely. and if you thought about it you wouldn't do it because that's quite <laughs> daunting isn't it it's like oh god so anyway that's a bit tiring but you get used to it so when it comes to assistance and obviously that they're there to really kind of support you and help you and let make you look like the hero that you are but when on the flip side how do you because ultimately you want to train them and you want them to yeah. do better and you want them to gain the skills on the flip side that how do you then kind of support them and immerse them in the training that you want them to get and get them to like yeah. learn and go far well it for me it all started when I very first started at Tony and Guy at that time in Australia we had these amazing session stylists come over from the UK and I don't want to name drop but they were they worked for Tony and Guy at the time and I was really lucky because I got to assist them and they brought me into that world and I discovered how amazing styling hair was because it was, to me, magical. You're making shapes all day. It's not like cutting hair and then if you mess it up, you're in deep trouble. If you're styling hair and you don't like it, you just brush it out and wash it. But for me, when I turned up with them and they were creating images that day, that is just magic because you're capturing this moment in time. And I was bitten by the bug. Mm -hmm. and quite often I was really daunted by this oh we're going to this photo shoot you know for a young person that's not been in that situation it's it's over can be a little bit overwhelming and they took me under their wing and they were really down to earth and they said look Maria it's just here these are just people this is just work don't be scared and they gave me this sense of safety mm -hmm. and they took the fear out of it because really it's just another day at work in a different environment. And then after that, I really took that ethos and thought I want to be able to share that with other hairdressers and take the fear out of that world. Because so many people in our industry are scared of, you know, going backstage or doing something that's not in their everyday world and think I'm not worthy, I could never be good enough. And that's not true because if you told me at my, tender age at 19 or 20 in Australia that one day I'd be doing Paris Fashion Week in my life I would have never believed you but it happened and I you know always wanted to give that back to young hairdressers and take them with me so I started doing all of that training in Tony Guy and then when I came to London I was working for TG which was at one point part of Tony and Guy and became the session director and my job was to create the session team. And I did training with this team and I did trends um, every season with them. And we went through that seasonal trend and styling training. But then I went through with them all of the skills that they would need backstage. And then I took them backstage with me. And that was a super popular thing that we had going. And for me, it was about building a team and camaraderie. So every year you'd lose one or two people um, and we'd add a couple more. But those uh, hairdressers loved working together as a team and they all had their own life. They had their, either their own salons or they worked for other companies. They're all TG people. Um, so we had that in common, but they looked forward to 
what we had we had training with them all the time and then they loved coming to the shows with me and that ran for about seven years and that team I still work with that team now even though I'm not with TG anymore because we built this bond and I think the most important thing about that was for me giving them the chance to be in that situation without having to worry about doing a hair test or organizing everything or all the other stressful stuff all they had to do was go there and be part of a team and listen and do their bit and they could be part of the experience and I think that was a super amazing thing and I always wanted to take the scariness out of it and make them feel like they're worthy to be there as well because everybody should be allowed to do that so that's what I do I think that's part of my passion and all also translating that stuff that we do backstage and helping them understand how to bring that into their salon and that's where the name ready to wear hairdressing came from for me because I wanted to bring all of that stuff that we do backstage and what people think is all high fashion but actually make it ready to use for the hairdresser ready to wear for the clients and then bring it into our world into normal everyday life so that's kind of what I do in a way, if so, that makes sense. Yes. So your education platform, which you spoke about just now, um, you've launched it um, in partnership with makeup artist Amy Barrington Long. Long. Yes. Um, who was kind of like, you, you've worked together throughout um, your career. Yeah. How do you think it works that, you know, you're um, a hairstylist, session stylist, you know, and, and she's makeup artist. How do you think that those kind of two areas of expertise really kind of blend together to create, you know, unique learning platform? I think you can't have one without the other. I think they would just like they're on an even um, playing field. I think makeup is so important because especially when you're creating, for me, it was always about, well, actually, Anthony, my old boss, it was always about creating a total image. You can't have, we were never fashion creators, we were fashion interpreters. So as a hairdresser, you, you're not creating fashion. You are part of this, I think, um, a collection of little ingredients that create a total look. So you're, you're, part, you're one of the accessories. And makeup is another integral part of that. So when I used to train, do my session course, which I, which I did for everyone or did my session t training, when I, I do a, a kind of like a global trends presentation at the very beginning. So it's got runway, editorial, lifestyle, um, makeup, everything in that. And that kind of paints a story visually to the hairdressers that are at the course. And then I go through and demonstrate these looks and with that, Amy was always with me doing the makeup for them. And then after every look, we then shot it for them so they could see what it looks like as an image, mm -hmm. as a total look. And then we had styling as well. And if you took the makeup out of it, it would have been a major component. It helps tell the story. Mm -hmm. So that's why when it was a, a natural progression for us, I thought if I wanted to do something, I couldn't do it without Amy because she was an integral part of me telling that story to our students every time. And also I think there's um, a really big interest for hairdressers about makeup as well. Um, makeup, hair color, style, hair styling, cutting, it all goes together and, and you have to understand each one to do your job properly. So even though I don't do makeup, I have to understand makeup to be able to talk about it. Does that kind of make sense? And same yeah. with, you know, even though I specialize in hair styling and cutting, I still have to understand color. Mm -hmm. And if someone changes their hair color, you have to understand how to tell them what makeup to choose mm -hmm. and change their color palette in their face. So we have to learn about everything as hairdressers. So I think it's really important, even though a hairstylist might come to your course and say, I just want to learn how to style hair. I think the more information you give them, it gives them more of a rounded understanding, well-rounded understanding of stuff to take back to their salon. Oh, I learned this stuff. And oh, if we change your color, then we can change your makeup. And 
then it opens up another conversation. So it just gives them more skills and more armor, like um, more education. So then they feel more confident and then they can make more money basically <laughs> because it's such a competitive world. Yeah. And I think hairdressing is 90% confidence and personality. You know, anyone can learn how to cut hair. I really believe that. I think to style hair, it's a bit more flair involved, mm -hmm. but it. I think if you are confident and you're and you really care about your clients, you'll be really busy in the salon. They'll come because they come back for you. They don't just come back for how you cut their hair. They come back for the the hairstylist. So if you're excited and you've got tons to talk about with them and you feel confident it's infectious and you'll have them forever. So if, the, if a student is with me for a day and they're feeling a bit glum about hairdressing and they're a bit bored and they leave and they feel inspired, even if they never recreate what I taught them, but they go back and they want to be hairdressing that day, I've won. Yeah. I've done my job. So that's basically it for me. <laughs> It's all about learning, isn't it, really? Like, and keeping that kind of momentum going and always being inspired. Like, because there's never, you don't just like finish your training and that's it. Like, you know, when you're working on like shoots now and, and shows, like, you must still be learning all the time. Every day, every day. And I think over the last year, like, it has been such uh like the hairdressing industry has been so affected by the hate to bring up the pandemic but you, you, the industry has been undeniably affected affected and as a result there's been a lot of hairdressers who and stylists like whether you're session stylists or working on shoots like who have been out of work so how do you think that over the last year that you yourself have been able to kind of offer uh, students and, and trainees and an option to kind of brush up excuse the pun their skills <laughs> in a time when they're not necessarily kind of like in a salon or on a shoot you know what it's been a really interesting time and it's so it sounds so cliche because even for me my life has changed completely since the pandemic and it was about going back to my roots and thinking well what can I do with the skills that I have in this situation and so I was doing a lot of zoom education with hairdressers and you think well no one's going to want to learn about hair now because no one needs to use it but in fact it was a great time to talk to hairdressers because they had a lot of time to listen mm -hmm. and downtime and that actually had a chance to sit down for a minute and learn something because if you if you know a hairdresser schedule in a salon you know, they work, every, you know, all the hours that God gives them and they're always on their feet and then they get home and they have to be with their family and it's just 24 seven. So they never really have time. If they come and do education, they have to take time out of work. So in fact, it was a really good time to get in touch with people and they can actually relax and you can connect with them. Mm -hmm. So I was doing Zoom education, which was quite interesting. And then I tried to take my trends onto Zoom as well, just to give a little bit of insight. And then luckily for me, the session world was still a little bit open and I still managed to do a few shows, although slightly different. Um, they were digital and then we did one live show, but with no guests, it was all filmed. That was interesting as well because we did the show and it was fabulous and then you couldn't tell anyone yeah because it was two <laughs> days before and it was getting edited and normally you, get, you know as soon as you leave you're you know posting things and high-fiving everyone yeah. you know and we just had to go home and be quiet <laughs> it was really <laughs> weird and no guests which is also weird because quite often the guests are more interesting than the people you know than the show yeah <laughs> um which, you know, I love people watching at these things. Yeah. I mean, I'm a jeans and t-shirt type of girl. As much as I love fashion, I'm a jeans and t-shirt girl and trainers. Um, but I love seeing what everyone wears to these things. And, and you know, the fashionistas, that, that's what it's all about. It's about the audience. So it was a, a different take on it, but it was great to still be able to do stuff. And for me, I think social media, as much as everybody hates it, it's been 
a godsend yeah for me because it's kept me in contact with the world and stayed relevant and it's a way of expression you know you could put a picture up of a work you did a year ago or something that inspires you and you're still communicating and you're still alive you have a heartbeat so you know just be it was about being positive and still connecting with people um I'm not saying I didn't have days where I just hibernated because I did that as well and then I I had to put my big girl pants on and say okay <laughs> it's time to talk to people again and so it was a day-to-day -day thing but it was great to still do a bit of fashion work that was quite good yeah. it kept my heart beating that was good yeah, I bet so there's so many different kind of facets to the hairdressing industry from kind of styling, like celebrity, bridal, editorial, the shows that you mentioned, like e-com, like in branding. Do you like thinking about kind of like new talent who are kind of entering the hairdressing industry at the moment? Do you think that it is important for them to have experience of all of those different sectors or do you think it's more important to specialise? Um, at the moment, the industry is really changing and they want everyone to know everything mm -hmm. because of budget. Mm -hmm. And I have issues with that. <laughs> <laughs> I have real issues with that because I was talking to a makeup artist yesterday and they were saying, oh, Maria, we really need to learn hair because every job we go to, they want us to do hair now. Mm -hmm. They don't want to book hairdressers because they only have budget for one person to do everything. And that to me dilutes things slightly. So I think it's good to be flexible and be able to learn a little bit if you can. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for hairdressers, it's really important to try things that are a bit out of their comfort zone and learn every, it's, in my day, you could specialize and say, okay, I'm a hairstylist and this is what I do. And I don't do men's barbering. I just do this. I just do women's hair. I'm a session stylist, blah, blah, blah. You didn't have to do color. You didn't have to do barbering. You just did that. And that was fine. Now, young people are asked to do everything. They have to know how to do clipper work and fading and gents barbering. They have to know how to color hair. They have to know how to do, you know, whatever, makeup and so on. So learn everything you can. But the reality is you're going to be better at one thing than the other. Mm. Does that make sense? Always. So always. And that's my reality. I could probably do a full head of foils. And I mean, I can physically do it. Am I great at it? No. Mm -hmm. Is my If my life depended on it, yes, I would do it. <laughs> yes. Same with makeup. I could never show up to a job and say I can do makeup like a makeup artist can. Mm -hmm because I just couldn't. So also I think the important thing is if someone asks you to do something and you don't know how to do it, don't blag it. Mm -hmm. Be honest because you don't want to show up to a job and just have all your fingers and toes crossed and then you let yourself down. You're only as good as your last job, you know? So that's why it's great to go and assist people if that are really good at things that you're not good at, you know, so you can learn. and. You know, it's going to have to be for free most of the time. But what you're getting from that is experience and knowledge, which you can't put a price on. So, you know, have an open mind, learn as much as you can from everyone and just kind of add it to your knowledge tool belt, I call it. And one day it might come in handy. It's, it's a bit like when I started training young hairdressers, you know, a thousand years ago, and we would be up to the bit of, Oh, let's do finger waves today. Oh, I don't want to do that because, you know, in the 90s, no one thought about finger waves. Everyone was ironing their hair straight and hacking it, you know, like back scissoring and things. You know, everyone had disconnected haircuts and all that stuff. No one cared about finger waves and tonging. And, and I would say, well, if you want to come to do a show somewhere or learn how to do styling, you know, you have to know how to do this stuff because it's going to come back and bite you in the bum if you don't. And I am proof of that now because all of that stuff is so necessary if you go and do a shoot. They could one day say to you, oh, our reference is 20s and you have to do a flat finger wave or something like that. And if you've never tried it in your life, just because you didn't fancy it, you're in big trouble. So you have to kind of 
trying to learn as much as you can. But I think honesty is the key. If you don't know how to do something, don't pretend you can. I think it's worse to show up and not know how to do it and ruin everyone's day. <laughs> show that you're willing to learn and use that feedback because if you did get asked to do a certain you know, technique and you couldn't do it and you were honest about it, but be honest about it, but then use it and use that feedback and then say, right, I'm going to make I'm going to go and learn that. Yeah. That's obviously what pe the clients are wanting right now. It's yeah. kind of boosting your skills in areas where, you know, the client is wanting them. And that would make you quite competitive. My best advice also to someone, you know, lots of hairdressers say, oh, Maria, what would happen if I turned up to do a shoot and they asked me to do something and I don't know how to do it? And I would say, be honest, but offer something else. Yeah. I can't do that, but what about this? Mm. This could really work. And I think that has saved me many times. You know, I don't know if I could do it that well and like that picture, but I could do this and it would look just as cool. Or can we try it? And quite often it organically works. Yeah. And that they love that you didn't just say, I don't know how to do it. And, you know, yeah. that you've actually given them another option. So that also is a good way to get around it. Yeah, if you've got a problem, go with the solution. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm sure you know how to offer something else that could look just as cool. Mm -hmm. And if you do that and stay confident, then, then, you'll, then you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. So throughout your career, you've, like, you've worked with so many kind of like up and coming stylists and, and mentored so many different people coming into the, um, the hair industry. Um, and really help them to kind of refine their skills in all sectors of the hairdressing industry. How do you think that working with new talent and mentoring new talent has in effect help you, helped you or had an effect on your work? Um, well, I think tremendously because they give you energy and they give you something to aspire to because every and I, it sounds so corny but whenever I'm working with teaching people I always learn something from them because it's the only the best way to learn something and I've always believed this is by teaching mm -hmm. because if somebody asks you a question it makes you have to think of what the answer is mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. um, I think being connected to young people as well and finding out what they need to learn keeps you connected to the world as well mm -hmm. and relevant and and because things change and evolve and their needs change and evolve um so you, you kind of inspire each other mm -hmm. it's really important so there's certain things that i can give them and then there's other things that they can give me because i think the my best hairdressing i probably did before I learned anything because it was fearless. Mm -hmm. And that's something you can only have in, the, in your career when you don't know the rules yet. And you can create something that's spectacular because you don't care about rules because you don't know any. And the more rules you learn, it can sometimes con contain your creativity. So I think sometimes working with young people that don't know the rules yet, they can teach you something, they can do something spectacular because they're not afraid of anything. And I think that's, that's magic as well. So it's great to be around that as well from the beginning and their excitement and their enthusiasm is infectious. Yeah. Well, yeah. you must get to see like with your um, ready to wear hairdressing platform, like you must be like working with so many amazing people like all the time and seeing new talent, which must be like so inspiring. What's next? Tell me what we can expect next from Ready to Wear Hairdressing. Well, exciting. We've got some new courses that are sold out now, which is fabulous. Wow. And so I'm really excited about that. But also the cool thing is we will, I will be running a course for this season's fashion week. So almost like what I used to do at TG, but I'm going to have my own Ready to Wear session team. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do training, which will be two days. And then the students will get to come with me backstage at Fashion Week. So I'm super excited about that. I haven't told everyone yet. I've been working on it and trying to figure out the logistics of it. But I'm really excited about that because just from meeting different people in the last few months, people message me and say, oh, Maria, I really want to assist you. How do I get into the industry? 
and it's difficult you know I don't want to cherry pick people and take them with me and I think if I offer this platform and people organically come to me and want to be part of it then I'll know I can take them on the journey mm -hmm. and I think being able to do some training with them and giving them more confidence and then that gives me confidence that when I show up at a show I can actually do the hair mm -hmm. because it's a bit of pressure and and just grow that I'm really excited about growing a team yeah um so I'm really hoping that hairdressers will respond to that and um call me and say Maria I want to be in the ready to wear session team so that's super exciting for me well thank you so much for joining me today like it's been so interesting hearing about your career and really exciting things that you've got going on at the moment and also um to come in the future so on on the only way is up as they say like really exciting time for the hairdressing industry I think oh thank you so much Hannah I've had a lovely time chatting to you I hope I haven't chatted too much no never um, enough <laughs> but it was it was so nice to talk about you know what's happened but also what's what's coming and, and being happy and positive and I hope to spread some of that goodness to everybody definitely well I'm <laughs> feeling it now well good thanks stuff so much again and I will speak to you soon okay lots of love take care then bye bye bye, bye.